Hello everyone, welcome to Remote Daily. We kick off today with a guest who we just had the honor hosting at the Hof, our uh, virtual series for Frankfurt Book Fair, the oldest and largest book fair in the world. She's the owner and operator of two bookstores on Granville Island in Vancouver, Canada. It's my honor to welcome Jennifer Kim to Remote Daily. Jennifer, so good to have you with us. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, our talk for the Hof for the Frankfurt Book Fair was amazing. And I think we touched on so many topics that I'm excited to go deeper on today. Yeah, you're about to travel to Frankfurt with a special program for um, for booksellers, uh, and you are representing the next generation in that program. And that is also why I would love to start with your personal story, because Humpty Dumpty Books and Music is a family business, and it has been there for over 25 years. You grew up there. You grew up in your parents' bookstore. So when the time came, was it assumed that you were going to take over? Uh, and if not, how did you actually come to that decision? Right. So, you know, it was never in my, you know, plans to take over the business at all. Um, I went to school, I did philosophy, um, you know, I started working, I worked at the Bank of Republic Library for many years. Um, and, um, you know, also always helping out at the shop whenever I could. And then when um, my mom had a sudden kind of health crisis and needed to retire, um, we actually looked seriously into packaging up the business to um, sell so that she could, you know, get the rest that she needed. And when we really, when it really came close and the reality came to four of actually turning away from the business and turning away from the book business and um, this amazing sort of access that we had. And it's like a small corner of, um, of, of service that we have with the public. Um, it felt like a real shame to let it go. And um, I, you know, I was considering going into, I mean, I was preparing to go to law school. I was putting in applications and doing the LSAT and everything. And I was like, okay, do I want to put in like, four years of law school and then like go uh, work up my way through a firm and still work for someone else or do I want to try and um, take over this business um, try and evolve it and grow it and see what I can do and contribute in my own way and uh, ultimately the decision was pretty easy when I put it that way and um, of course like uh we had some conditions of uh, me taking over, you know, um, I made sure that my mom understood that, you know, this was going to be, you know, she's really retiring and, um, you know, <laughs> she can uh, kind of take that really seriously and just rest finally and um, not worry. And, you know, as like an immigrant um, business owner, um, woman, single mom, um, I mean, my parents had the business together, but then they divorced and then took on the business on her own afterwards. Um, it was very difficult for her, you know, and um, she was extremely worried for me. And knowing what, look, because she had such an intimate um, experience of running the business herself and everything, right. she knew exactly what I would be doing and getting into. So she, on the one hand, didn't want me to do like, what she did because it's a lot of work. It's a lot of physical work. It's a lot of mental work. It's a lot of emotional work. And, um, but we talked it all out and we um, agreed upon, um, you know, this would be my baby. Um, and uh, all of the, all of the creative and financial and all of the control would be, would be up to me. And, um, you know, she just uh, made me promise that I wouldn't like, you know, sink thousands of dollars into like renovations and and like just all the things just that, a like few a, promises just a few promises that of course i've slightly broken over the years but um yeah no it's yeah you told us preparing for the session you're a korean canadian right that's is would that be the correct right way of saying it yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and you you told us like I mean now we're so used to hearing from entrepreneurs talking about failure and sometimes even fetishizing failure. It's like oh yeah you know break it and um, whatever you know what if what would you do if 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 you couldn't uh, fail? Um, 
uh, or you know all these like bumper sticker phrases fail fast and all that in your case what you just said is that wasn't an option right because and you you said it has to do with the immigrant experience can you explain that more like why is there so much caution and so much fear connected to the immigrant experience when having a family business yeah i mean i think for my mom i think yeah we spoke about this briefly last time but like when i took over the business she told me she's like i want you to take martial arts like a martial arts class i want you to be prepared just in case like something you need to defend yourself physically and i was like oh my god that gave me a little bit of insight into how vulnerable she felt and of course you know i i sort of laughed it off and like i reassured her and i was like i I'm okay, mom. Like I don't need to take self-defense classes to to take on a business, but it showed me um, that uh, her experience warranted this feeling, you know, because feelings um, are always valid, right? And they may not come from a rational place, but you know, they come from something. And um, it, I think, it comes from you know. Um, you know, uh, not having uh, an established community that can guide a person through um, um, some of the difficulties of navigating business, like negotiations and like leases and contracts and um, just how things um, are established and done by, you know, the establishment mm -hmm. and also um, language barrier, um, just a lot of the the typical things that um, pose, uh, you know, barriers for immigrants, especially immigrant women. Um, I think that was something that um, I saw uh, in my mother's experience. And so um, that in part also motivated me to really, you know, continue on the business and show her and show myself and show the world that, um, uh, you know, the continuation of that and how it can evolve and grow and, and still be resilient and, and become stronger. And, um, yeah. It's fascinating and sad uh, to hear that your mom recommended for you to take up martial arts, uh, to defend a bookstore, but it's, it's, it, thank you for sharing that. And, um, mm -hmm. I mean, you grew outgrew this takeover because as we said in the very beginning you opened this kind of dreamlike space that we see behind you in little oasis um with your new multi multilingual bookstore so again you started uh like your mom you started from scratch and are creating a new world and you also brought a question here uh to us in in the audience that is related to to local bookstores like the ones you're running what would you like to know from from every one of us today yeah, I would love to know um, what is it about your local bookstore that you love the most? Like, how how does it feel when you go into your favorite local bookstore? So this is a lot. Um, Jennifer, what stands out to you when you look at the answers in the chat? Yeah, I mean, I just agree um, with all of this. Um, second home, like so much, like it has to feel cozy and um like a hug, like a mental hug, and also like um, the calming soothingness of being surrounded by these quiet little monuments, you know, that people have created all over time, some, you know, written thousands of years ago, you know, hundreds of years ago, just, you know, a few years ago. Um, and just like, it's all there, it's history and the future and it's all just quietly waiting for you to discover it and i just yeah and i couldn't agree more with like the smell of new books and um all the community feeling that you get like the connection like the eye contact that you can get from like a fellow book lover in a bookstore <laughs> is just yeah. so great and when you can connect over like your favorite book um it's so such a like a heart cozy feeling that is not, you know, replicable. Like it's, it's something very special. Lots and, of uh, love stories begin, uh, over bookshelves. And, mm -hmm. uh, we had a previous guest on remote daily, 
um, who started the Subway Book Review, Uli Bodger Cohen here in New York City. So what she did for years uh, was just going on the subway and ask people what they were reading and then posting that on an Instagram account. And it also turned into a book that was published last year between the lines. And she always wears a book, uh, a, a, a tote bag, and she actually passes that on to her community that says, ask me what I'm reading. And um, I have seen her doing this live on the subway. It is the most beautiful thing. There is something, even when you are on the subway, when you connect around books that you have nowhere else. However, though, right now we're sharing this space and a lot of people say this is the future. And right now we are going even beyond this, this two dimensional gathering spaces we're, and we're talking about the metaverse, the, the, the web three, the three dimensional internet where we will be able to go into a website, not just two dimensionally, but we will actually be able to walk through it and buy books of a virtual shelf. And of course, the book industry is affected by that willingly. So what do you say to people who think, ah, paper? Who think this is not relevant anymore? What is your response? Yeah, I find um, there is a you know growing sentiment in a minority of people, I think, still a minority where, you know, people question the relevance of printed matter, printed books. And um, to that, I have to say, it is going to be what we make of it. And I think what we're going to make of it is that it's going to become like, um, you know, something that is essential for us to create deep connection, deep moments and deep reading. Like when you are reading something on it, on a device or your phone or um, a computer or whatever, you are competing with so many other things that are laying below the surface. Um, it's just a different energy and vibe altogether than when you give yourself the permission to actually um, cozy up with a physical book. It is an entire product in, onto itself. You know, it is a beginning, middle, and end, and it is. Um, complete unto itself and um it is very special in that sense where you don't have any other competition of course there's like the physical material world around you but you have physically lifted this item and you have chosen this item and um that sort of um one-to-one -one connection i think is something that creates different kinds of um neural pathways that um you know we're gradually sort of being driven to lose in our in our daily lives because of all of the um, the digitization of everything and the way we consume most information these days so um it also i think encourages you to take time to sit with thoughts and ideas mm -hmm. in a way that aren't competing with one another so aggressively um I think certain times you need, like, you know, when you're reading a book on philosophy, you kind of need to chew on it. And then you need to, like, swallow it and maybe, like, burp it up a little bit and then <laughs> just, like, wave it around a bit. And, you know, you need to, like, sit with it for a while, right? Like, it doesn't, you can't just, like, do the Wikipedia page scroll and then, like, feel like you actually have gotten it. You may have it at a surface level. But to actually speak and think about it, it you, you require time and you require physical attachment to the idea, I think. And that's why, um, you know, printed matter is never going to go away. Um, and especially printed matter for children, printed matter in different languages. Um, you also need that time, I think, with languages, language acquisition, and language appreciation, just like the beauty of um, you know the sound of languages as you're reading, it's not the same when you have like a, you know, like an Instagram post that's like a dual language, like you know, s s poem in you know English and Korean or whatever. It's not the same as when you're just absorbing it, scrolling through this like black screen at 3 a.m. But like when you have given yourself permission to, you know, go to the bookstore and talk to somebody about this you're also like proselytizing about the language and the book and the author in a way you're advocating for it while you're purchasing it uh, and then you take that 
item and you take it into your home and you create a little nook for yourself, you create a moment of, you know, your you time to enjoy and absorb and commune with this, this piece of art, you know, and I think that's something that is going to become like, and I hope it doesn't become like this extremely like luxury thing, mm -hmm. but you know, we all need to, not consider it like a luxury thing like we need to we need to claim this back into our lives um and that's kind of what we hope to do um at nurungji um you know the meaning of nurungji is kind of interesting like it's it's a korean word for the bottom of the pot like the rice pot when it gets scorched like it kind of gets burnt and crispy and we found that like um different parts of the world different languages different cultures all have their own word for this. And, um, you know, like in uh, Persian, it's Kadig, and, and I think um, in El Salvador, it's Kokolon. And, you know, there's tons of different words for this in all different languages. And it's, it, it, I chose this word because it's supposed to embody um, looking for commonalities across difference and also um, finding the silver lining in any situation. Like just because something is burnt doesn't mean it's bad. It can be delicious. You can make it delicious. You can make a soup out of it. You can make a delicious um, dessert out of it. You know, it's um, so, yeah. Wow, so much to unpack here. Uh, and and said it is actually the best part. I think Nurongji is definitely the best part uh, of Vancouver at the moment. Uh, to have this new oasis is just so fascinating. You told us that how people are flocking to it. And this is not, it's not just a bookstore. Um, you created a multilingual bookstore. So that means just when we look behind you, uh, Jennifer, can you give us a quick insight? How many languages are there? Honestly, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you right now. And we're full of people on a, on a quiet Friday morning. We have, um, you know, Tagalog, Japanese, Chinese, German, um, French, Spanish. Um, we have um, Arabic, uh, Farsi, Hindi. We have a lot and more to come. Um, and it's just, uh, it's been incredible, the reception and like the, the look on people's face when they see their language or their people um, front and center in such a central and like prominent space in the city is extremely moving to me and like when their eyes light up and they like just like run to the book and they just go like I can't believe I'm finding this here look like somebody cares about this somebody cares about us and like uh this is the first time I'm seeing this kind of book here I can actually like reconnect with my language here like that is what I think drives me and um i think that is what the future of publishing um needs to be um and future of like you know international public rights like everything like we all need to be looking towards um you know encouraging fostering and serving the uh, multilingual community because we all are um multilingual uh, whether it is an actual you know um, language that we grew up with or not, you know, we're living in uh, a very, you know, increasingly diverse and accessible world. And um, the publishing and book selling industry needs to catch up with that. Absolutely. And, and uh, Rashad is just bringing up um, the current, the current uh, happenings here in the US around banning certain books. Um, and to get to that, Jennifer, what, like, why, why isn't why aren't multilingual bookstores anywhere? I mean, it makes so much sense for so many places in the world, but you told us preparing for the yeah. session, are you, you even think you might be the only one or one out of two in, in, in Canada, which is the second largest country on this planet. Why is that? I think, I mean, I, I, I know that there is um, one like South Asian bookstore out in the suburb Surrey that serves the local community, um, South Asian community there. And I think there is a French language multilingual bookstore in Quebec, but um, 
it's not like uh, I don't believe they their aim is to encompass like all the languages that they can and I I'm not sure like I remember when I first kind of started thinking about the idea and talking about the idea to people every single person was like this is an amazing idea and like why why don't we have this already um and um and I and I do think it is a matter of access and um, I do think it's a matter of like um um you know maybe just uh, a short-sightedness or a lack of awareness in um in different industry levels where they're not seeing um what they could be making money on wow. uh, really it's, it's not just um i mean it's definitely um uh important social cause multilingualism but it, as a business i think it is just the way forward too like it's it's um people are extremely into this and and um especially for the younger generation especially for children um mm-hmm. just all around and um I, I for myself as like a bookseller and book buyer i find it incredibly difficult to find multilingual materials in north america currently um and if i want to buy directly from um you know, foreign publisher, foreign language publishers, uh, it's a lot of hoops to jump through. And I, I wish there were um, an easier way. And perhaps there is, and I just am not aware of it currently. And I'm just, you know, need to um, find this magical distribution company based out of, you know, Europe or Asia, where they, they actually have a warehouse full of all the languages of the world. Maybe this is, this is actually my dream. Like if, this were true like i will be so happy to be wrong or um, as so many entrepreneurs before you you will actually create that company yeah honestly if you know the more i think about it uh it needs to happen like it's something that i really care a lot about um and if i had you know uh, my mom asked me this question like a few months ago she's like if you had 10 million dollars what would you do and <laughs> the first thing i said was i would buy a warehouse and um, like higher container ships. And um, I would, you know, build up a distribution company. And then my mom was like, oh, you wouldn't buy me a house? <laughs> like, and I was like, no, mom, I, no, like that's later. But you, you asked me what that's I would send later. on first. <laughs> right. I felt bad, but I was like, no, that's like, really, that's the first thing I thought of because uh, it's something that is, it's just like being here and like um, doing it the way that I can right now, I'm seeing the need. Like it's, there's a hunger for it. And um, yeah, maybe in Germany, I'll find an angel investor. I don't know. Let's see. Books, the book fair is ready for you. I hope it is um, because you're clearly shaping the future of this industry. Um, I I wanted to, to ask you about politics for a moment because Rashad brought it up, you know, the, the, the ban uh, of certain books in the U.S. Of course, we also had just had in New York the attack on, on Salman Rushdie, um, the brutal attack uh, that happened in upstate. Uh, and there is there is this threat to freedom of speech on this side of the world. Um, now, as a bookstore owner, what do you think you can play in this um, sort of like helping people navigate a world with echo chambers. Like, how do you see the role a bookstore can play in this? Or maybe you do, maybe you already have an example for how you do it when somebody comes in and you see, mm, yeah, they're in a little chamber. Maybe, maybe I can get them out. Right. So, yeah, I think it's incredibly important to champion free speech and intellectual freedom. And, um, you know, what happened to Salman Rushdie is insane. Like, um, this is not, um, you know, words can never be equated to violence. I think that's really important. Definitely there's such a thing as fair speech, you know, but um, when things result, when words result in violence, violent retaliation, I think that that is uh, signaling um, uh an escalation and something different. And, um, you know, when that happened, our sales of Rushdie books went up the roof, you know, and it's gonna actually have the opposite effect. 
of what um, these perpetrators are intending. Um, and there's just no way you can suppress thought and thinking and disagreement. You can only reason with it. You can only persuade. And the best persuasion is to approach with non-judgment and to approach with curiosity and to approach with empathy. And, um, you know, when we are um, hiring staff and training staff here, like it's extremely important to me that um, this is not a platform for um, your ideology and your ide agenda. And, you know, I may very well agree with, you know, whatever you believe and like whatever, um, you know, you want to forward as a person personally. But the bookstore is, it is a public commons and we have to honor it and respect it with just the deepest level of integrity. And what that means, I think, is to approach every person with compassion, non-judgment, um, you know, um, meet them where they're at and present things in a way that they don't feel uh, attacked. Um, and maybe like, you know, the other day somebody came in looking for um, Jordan Peterson's 12 rules or I forget what the title is exactly called, but, you know, and like there's contention around him, there's contention around, you know, his work. And um, we don't have that book here, but uh, there is no judgment. Absolutely not. Um, I directed him towards um, a section of School of Life books that we have, you know, by Alain de Botton. And um, we got into a really nice conversation about just um, where he was coming from. And um, he ended up buying a bunch of books for himself and his children on self-development um, and like kind of interactive books, like workbooks and things like that, that the School of Life has um, for both adults and children. It's, you know. Are there books you, you yourself would not stock, uh, Jolie asks in the chat? Oh, well, I mean, it's, yeah, of course. I mean, it's not like, and it's not because of like, um, you know, some, I mean, sure, there's like, you know, ideological and political um, underpinnings for everything, you know, everything, every single thing that is in this shop is selected by me. Um, so for sure, there's things that I won't put in here. There's only so much space. So in a sense, um, book selling is an incredibly uh, interesting and subversive tool for presenting your worldview, um, I think. But also, there is no way that I would ever say to somebody, I, would, I don't carry this book, like in a way where it's like, um, I'm looking down on this book, Got or it. I don't agree mm -hmm. with this book. Like, that's just, I don't think that is uh, mm -hmm. my place. Um, I am not the ultimate arbiter. Um, you know, I, and that is also, if, especially if I disagree with the book or if I don't agree with the approach of the, the person who's inquiring about the book, the way to reach someone is not to be like, oh, you, you like this author, like, oh, like, no, like <laughs> the way you, you change minds is to say, oh, how interesting. Like, what yeah. do you like about, what do you like about this author? Tell me more. Um, I can't wait to show you this one too. Like I, that sounds similar to this, or that sounds different from what I thought about this. You know, man, I wish we had more of a conversation like that in other fields. You know, uh, when mm -hmm. people have controversial opinions to one another and say, "So, what do you like about that?" Instead of like attacking each other. Um, and uh, as Shirley says, you are a curator, and he actually told us before the session that curating the books and the music is a huge thing of what you enjoy because ex exactly you're building your own world there is one thing though that happens to you where worlds cross is that people come into a store just like they go anywhere else these days and they look up books on the shelf and then they you see them getting out their phone and scrolling through amazon <laughs> doing like a little price comparison and you're standing sort of next to to them what what do you do yeah you know what i I've gone through phases with this, but you know, ultimately what I've come to realize is it is an opportunity for connection. If I chose, if I wanted to choose to feel bad and just be like, oh, like make a judgment and be like, oh, they're just, 
making an Amazon list and they're just, they don't care about independent bookstores. They don't care about a local economy. You know, I could do that, but I could also say, you know what, maybe they're looking for information. Maybe they're looking for reviews. Maybe they are, um, you know, just looking for something. And so what we do now is when we see that in the store, we see it as an opportunity to approach people and just make a little connection. And also just to remind them like, hello, like a human being here, how are you? Um, and also just ask like, you know, is there anything I can help you with about the book? Is there anything you were curious about? And see it as an opportunity to connect. And I actually have this one story of this guy who literally was like, can you price match Amazon? And I was like, you know what, I won't. And uh, here's why. And I gave him some really good reasons. You know, I was like, we have a flexible schedule for people that supports like um, creatives and in, in this local economy. It allows them to pursue their art and their studies and um, are single moms, you know, with their needs of scheduling around childcare. Um, we pay fair wages. We um, don't, you know, have a warehouse where people have to wear diapers and like are surveilled in like a truck to maximize their like ultimate efficiency. Like we have a very pleasant work environment and um, we foster growth and, and reading and, and community. And, um, you know, if it weren't for us physically here with this physical book in front of you, presenting this book to you, you would have never thought to type into Amazon this title of book. It would have never come to you because Amazon, the way it works is it, works off the algorithm algorithms of what you already like what you already know and the way that i have curated my bookstores is to just totally like completely remove myself from all the sales data all of the mechanisms and tools that people generally use as booksellers like the top 40 lists the sales reps recommendations list like i don't use that wow. i i have my own way of researching and digging books like Really, I'm a crazy person, I guess, but like it's something that I'm passionate about finding different unique titles. And that's one of the top comments that we get about our bookstores is that it's unique. Like you don't see these books elsewhere. And um, of course, we do have books that, you know, are popular and, and are important and are current. But, you know, I think the, the secret sauce of a good bookstore is you do the work. Um, and you create that opportunity for people to be surprised and delighted. Mic drop. Eileen uh, is asking about a number though. Uh, is there an average difference that you can give between like you didn't, you said just, you just said you, you, you won't price match for, for very good reasons. Um, is there an average like difference between Amazon and a bookstore price? You know, it's actually really funny. I, I think the common notion is that things on Amazon are the cheapest price because they do that thing where they like do the slash or whatever. Yeah. But actually, a lot of my books are cheaper in person than on Amazon. Oh, wow. And of course, some things like the front list titles that the sales reps and the publishing houses that they are all, all kind of marketing and churning out season by season, like the, the top uh, front list, you call it like bestsellers of the season, mm -hmm. they will probably be, you know, offered on a discount because that's the nature of the industry and like the nature of marketing in the book industry. But um, I don't really um, carry necessarily, it's, I'm, I'm not a front list heavy back uh, bookstore. I'm a back list heavy back bookstore, which means things that are um, more evergreen, like evergreen books that are, have been around for a while that are maybe forgotten but are really good. Um, and those kinds of gems, when you try to look for those things uh, online, the price will be like, you know, I remember I looked up one book um, that I had in store and it was like $876 on Amazon. And so I would love um, wow. people to challenge their own notion that uh, what they see online is the full breadth of what is out there. You know, when you're searching for, you know, a subject like, let's say, um, Kantian metaphysics or whatever, you're going to get, you know, a very limited number of mm -hmm. books on Amazon, but that's not going to be actually what's really out there, you know, and you, you are owe it to yourself to go visit your local um, bookstore, bookseller, or your local librarian to, or do your own research to see really fully um, what is truly really the breadth of the subject that you're looking mm -hmm. for. 
When my partner and I did our book tour, what to, what I didn't know is when we walked into many bookstores and 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 uh, bookstore owners would repeatedly telling us what people forgot is, you can go to your local bookstore and usually they can get you a book in a day if it's in a larger metropolitan city. It's just as fast as Amazon. It's not even it's not cheaper to buy online and it's not faster in many many ways if you have access to a metropolitan area. So thank you for busting some of the myths here. Um, Eileen has a, a, a special uh, question to geek out on. Any resources that you have for out of print books? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I really hate to see a really good book go out of print. And um, the best resource I can tell you is like libraries. Yeah, I mean, having worked for the public library system here for a really long time, I'm a little bit biased, but I think libraries are incredible and essential and um what i can also recommend is if you have a book that you love do go and check it out of the library like it'll go like i used to work at the central branch here and one of the most heartbreaking experiences that i had was like having to call our art fine art section i had to take beautiful tomes of old design magazines and we had to throw them away i of course like secretly rescued a few tomes but like you know, when things don't circulate, they go, um, when things don't circulate, they are discarded and they go out of print. And, um, and that means like, you know, when you see something you like, buy it, buy it in the store, you know, buy it online, like whatever. But when you know something is good, buy it for yourself, buy it for your friends, uh, if it's an important book. Um, but, you know, there's, of course, all lots of uh, online channels for out of print books. Um, we all know them, I think, like, you know, A-books and, and whatnot. Um, but the quality there is not always the best. But libraries, I would say libraries. And last audience question here, uh, also from Eileen. Um, I, I love this question. Is Barnes & Noble a local bookstore, in your opinion? Um, no. <laughs> Um, well, I guess the equivalent of that in Canada would be Chapters Indigo, and I would say no, but, um, you know, still, you know, better than, you know, Amazon, just because of, like, the monster that Amazon is, and, um, you know, Jeff Bezos' yacht and everything, like, at least it's not at that level. Not a lot but... of books on that yacht. Yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah. Is there, uh, when you look at your night shelf for a moment, and as the last question for today, I can't believe this hour is over already. Any book on your nightstand at the moment that we should um, maybe follow you on and read, Jennifer? Okay, so I'm reading this latest novel by Mohsen Hamid, who is one of my favorite contemporary writers. And uh, it's called The Last White Man. The cover is just gorgeous. Um, but also his writing style is so perfect. It's just different. It's confident. It's stylish. Um, and it just grips you. And he's actually going to be at the Frankfurt Book Fair. And honestly, if I meet him, oh. I will just cry. <laughs> I will lose my mind. <laughs> wow. Uh, great. I just shared a link here to the recent NPR yes. story. And I can't believe that Liz just put in the chat, I'm also reading that book. <laughs> I think we're, we're really connecting here uh, over the virtual bookshelf. How wonderful is that? Uh, your last 30 seconds with us, Jennifer. Um, how can we support you? What would you like to leave with us today before we part our ways? It's hard to let you go. Um. I just want to thank you so much for joining this um, this amazing session and giving me the opportunity to connect with you in this intimate way. Um, I am on Instagram and I, LinkedIn, and I apologize, my profile is super weird there right now, but I promise to make it more polished soon. But if you would like to connect with me through Instagram, uh, the most um, active uh, account right now is nurungji.ca. Um, and I'm posting stories daily from my bookstore, lots of dog wow. visitors, lots of fun moments. And um, yeah, I would love to stay connected and just uh, keep the conversation going. Fantastic. Jennifer Kim, um, what an amazing work that you do. What an important role that you play. And what an encouraging uh, and amazing entrepreneur you are. Uh, I'm so glad that we got to connect and I hope we can invite you back um, 
who knows maybe together with Mosin Hamid on a future session um, and uh, hopefully see you soon um, on Granville Island so for everybody who is in Vancouver or is going to Vancouver maybe some of you are planning at the moment don't miss out on Nurungji books and Humpty Dumpty books and music both on the same island uh, and both part of the future of this industry thank you so much Bye, have a great weekend bye